Aloha and welcome to Figments, the power of imagination. I'm Dan Leaf. I go by Fig and thus the name. And I've got a great guest today. We'll get to that in a minute. But first, of course, I have to do my opening rant. What will I rant about? The Ukraine situation um, looking pretty dicey in the East. And uh, our guest will be able to give us a from the from the front lines update. But um, if if Russian forces don't withdraw, we lose. So a stalemate that leaves some Russian presence, in my mind, is absolutely a defeat for the world order, not just for Ukraine, not just for NATO, but for the world order. Uh, secondly, I have my Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum uh, shirt on today because it's 80 for 80 day. 80th anniversary for the 80 brave men who got into B-25s on the aircraft carrier Hornet's deck and flew to Japan and bombed Japanese islands uh, in a stunning, shocking uh, turn of events just five and a half months after the war started with the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, the attack by the Doolittle Raid, I think, changed the course of the war. It affected uh, things profoundly on both sides of the Pacific. And we should remember those brave men. And we ought to ask ourselves, how come we were so good at surprises then and we're so bad at surprises now? That irritates me. Um, we need to do better. We should be as imaginative as they are. And my guest is pretty imaginative about how he supports um, uh, American troops and State Department people around the world in doing their missions. Um, I'd ask you to go back, speaking of the Ukraine, and look on the ThinkTech website or the YouTube ThinkTech playlist for the military in Hawaii standing with the Ukraine episode. I did an interview with Jay Fidel, and uh, I think you'll find some uh, thoughts of interest to you. But that's not why we're here today. Let's talk about why we're here. Uh, we're here to talk about patriotism without politics. And to do that, I've got a very special guest, a man who I met through my daughter. You all met her on Figments. Um, and she introduced me to his nonprofit, Spirit of America. And uh, Jim Hake, aloha and welcome uh, to Figments, the power of imagination. You're a pretty imaginative guy. How are you doing, Jim? Hello, Hoppy. Great to be with you. You're just back from Ukraine, got back Saturday? Yes. And uh, you shared a briefing with many of us who are interested in the work of Spirit of America. We'll get to that some. Uh, I've got to give the viewers a caveat, though, in this, my 28th episode of Figments, The Power of Imagination. Jim's done a gazillion interviews with people far more important and polished than I am on, with the Wall Street Journal and major broadcast outlets. Uh, watch all those if, if you want to get the rest of the story. I really want to find out how this figment happened, this unique charity. Uh, Jim, I'd say Spirit of America is pretty darn unique, isn't it? Yeah, we are one of a kind. We're the only privately funded nonprofit that's approved by the Department of Defense to work alongside U.S. military personnel all around the world to provide private assistance in support of their missions. We have uh, pioneered a very entrepreneurial approach to, I'll say, national security and humanitarian mm -hmm. issues that is a great complement for what government can do. And um, it's, yeah, we're, we're one of a kind, Fig, yes. We are one of a kind, and, and uh, the tagline, uh patriotism without politics, in my mind, has two elements. One is, uh, you're not red or blue. Uh, you might be inside, you might be in the ballot box, but but uh, in your actions, they're not politically uh, lean, leaning or constrained. And the other is you get beyond what the government can do because it is a political process. Uh, I've got some old pictures of you here. Well, not, a, not all of you, but where does that patriot come from? That's your dad on the left as a Navy CB, did you say? Yeah, he, he was a, uh, a young 22-year-old uh, uh, young man in, in that photograph. He joined the Navy to uh, join the fight in World War II. He was a CB. Uh, he was in the European theater. Uh, he was uh, D-Day plus two. 
uh, at Utah Beach, wow. you know, and, and so the Seabees awesome. lay down all the uh, infrastructure so heavy artillery troops can move it in, in you know, massive numbers. And uh, so after the, the beachhead was established uh, on D-Day, you know, the Seabees came in, laid down all the pontoons so everything else could roll in. Um, well, is, is that the source of your patriotism, of your sense of service to the country, or is there more to the story? Well, I, I think there's a lot more to the story because my dad, like most uh, members of our greatest generation, mm -hmm. never really talked a lot about his service. And, you know, it was he did his part. He was not, uh, you know, not honored in any special way, but he was just one of the Americans that did did his part, did their part. And that's why we always remember him as the, the greatest generation. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure quite what it is. Uh, mm -hmm. I have always felt as long as I can remember that the ideas and ideals for which America stands are the, the best ideas in the world, that every person uh, has the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I don't think you get any better than that. And uh, you know, maybe part of that was growing up. I you know, was born and grew up in the Philadelphia area, our nation's mm, birthplace. And right. you know, in Philadelphia, you're always trying to take, you know, credit for as much as you can because you don't, you don't uh, get, you know, there. You always uh, feel like you're maybe at the middle or bottom <laughs> of the list. Um, and one of the things that we had growing up was a copy of the Declaration of Independence on the stairway, going from you know downstairs to upstairs to where the kids all had our rooms. And so I, I walked by that declaration every day growing up. And I can't say I stopped and reflected on it each time. So no, I'm but... running up or down, but that was uh, part of the uh, uh, part of the uh, ethos of, of growing up, uh, being connected to our, our nation's birth. So my daughter, Yateng, who, whom you've met, and you know she's an amazing human being and, and leader above more than anything else. She talks a lot about the importance of symbols and rituals in informing your beliefs and in, in, in pursuing organizational goals, which is an aside to say, I had the, a similar thing in our household. And my dad served in the Navy at the end of World War II. His father had served in, in Europe as a Marine in World War I, right at the end. And uh, he passed away when I was five, but my grandfather's service cap with the globe and anchor sat on the same table you're talking about in our in our house of the era and you're right i didn't stop and genuflect to it or necessarily um ponder it consciously but it was always there just like your declaration of independence which is truly one of the most remarkable documents ever but that's not why we're here and you have had a pretty big family Four siblings, if I remember. Yeah, there were there were five uh, uh, of us kids. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm sure at times an unruly, really bunch. I was the youngest of the five. Oh, you were the youngest, but were you the best football player? Because I got to show this picture because it is uh, a pretty cool picture. You, yeah, that, uh, that's that's my scene. Zero hair. <laughs> yeah, the old hair. The old yeah, the, the old uh, 1970s era uh, hair helmet. And uh, yeah, that's that's from high school football. I, I was the, the captain of our team. I think my yeah, brother was a better football player than, than I was, but uh, uh, I wore the same number as he did, uh, you know, in, in uh, playing high school ball. What position did you play? I was an offensive guard and a linebacker. Uh, I played uh, outside linebacker in our small town at 103 pounds. So I played mostly on my butt after getting knocked <laughs> on my butt. <laughs> Uh, but the family, you kind of reinforce your sense of service because I, I had uh, six siblings, uh, five of whom survived. And, um, you know, you have roles and responsibilities that you, know, you can't wait to be asked to fill. You just do it. OK, for my siblings, I was not always perfect about that. So I don't want nasty emails. So then you went to school, went to Dartmouth and Stanford and studied business and uh, and had a pretty good career. Uh, uh, here's a good life picture watching it. Yeah, I think you said it was a Clippers game, uh, but it's right after 9-11. Right. right? right. And uh, that, those are my two sons. They were four and seven at the time. Yeah. And we were at, a, at a, a basketball game in Los Angeles where I lived at the time. And uh, it was 9-11 that, prompted me to start Spirit of America. 
So I'm reading your face there um, that, because I was in Pentagon on 9-11. We have a, sh a shared experience just like every other American that you're, um, and it, it's, you know, there is a real sense, even though I was already in the military as a you know, one star in the Pentagon. But what can I do? What, what can I do uh, to confront this situation? But you weren't in the military. You were a venture capitalist. I'm going to assume that you're doing pretty well. Pretty well. Well, at, at the time, I was uh, I had started a an internet software company called Big Buttons, which was a predecessor to the apps on iPhones and tablets mm. today. And the same idea, you know, you press them. That's why it was called Big Buttons. You press a big button to get the information you want, rather than having to search around the web to to find it. And uh, I started that, I actually closed the first round of funding for that on the exact day that the NASDAQ peaked in March of 2000, and which was both good news and bad news, because the good news was you could, you know, it was a frothy market to raise money in. The bad mm -hmm. news was everything went downhill from there. Right. And it uh, uh, made it difficult to make it through what I refer to as the internet extrusion process at the time. So when the attacks of 9-11 occurred, I was looking for a buyer for the, the software mm -hmm. uh, that we had built. And my immediate thought uh, when those attacks occurred was I, I wanted to do something to help. And, but I didn't have any idea what I could do that would be useful. And it was, a, a, and I didn't have any government or military background whatsoever. I didn't, I never met an active duty member of the military at all. No so kidding. I, yeah, no, 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 no kidding. And uh, oh, wow. so that I didn't uh, have any background was a good thing for two reasons. One is I was open-minded and you know didn't know what couldn't be done. That's a little bit of the obvious one. But the, the other part was that I knew I didn't know. So I wasn't going to be the so-called smart guy who could figure out what needed to be done in Iraq or Afghanistan or anyone else. So the very, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about it, but the premise of the organization was based on listening to people closest to the problem and listening to what they say is needed rather than come in from a top-down, uh, you know, I, I lived customer? in Alabama. What's that? The customer, kind of? <laughs> well, yeah, right, exactly. What you know, a concept. <laughs> no kidding. And, you know, one of the things in international, uh, the world of international aid and assistance is, well, kind of how the country operates around the world yeah. is the just about the exact opposite of what we know in our own economy has given us the most dynamic and innovative economy in the history of the world. But what we use as a nation, mainly driven by our, our government institutions, uh, you know, great in many ways as they are, is a top-down approach, which doesn't, it just doesn't work as well as more bottom-up uh, right. you know, entrepreneurial approaches. And it's heavily constrained. There are, I think you're right, there are pluses and minuses to it. Um, speaking to a leader of a government coming out of a long period of isolation, who uh, complained about dealing with the U.S. Uh, for arms sales. Uh, so why should we do that? I said, well, there are two things. You get better stuff because we make better stuff. And secondly, you get all these constraints and these rules, and they reinforce a legitimate um, uh, ethical approach to business. But sometimes you have to be faster than that. And that's where your business approach really delivered. And I, I have the baseball that's a, with the Spirit of America logo on that you sent to some of us on the board of advisors there. But that's that's was your initial idea came from what uh, somebody, a, a soldier in Afghanistan was doing with with local people to connect with them. Yeah, it was a really a remarkable story and a genuine light bulb moment. So it took me a while to figure out what I could do that would actually be useful. And mm -hmm. especially as an entrepreneur, you learn pretty quickly that you can't confuse motion with progress, that you actually have mm -hmm. to produce results or you're dead. You know, there's right. figuratively speaking, of course. And uh, so I stumbled upon this was in 2003 at this point where people still channel surfed right now with everything's on demand you don't really channel surf uh, as much if at all channel surfed i came upon this national geographic show that was telling the story of the special forces team in afghanistan and the scene that caught my eye was these special forces soldiers playing baseball with afghan boys and girls and you have this uh, sergeant first class jay smith 
telling a story about how this came to be that you know he and one of his uh, you know, uh, teammates on the um, you know special forces A team you know brought over their mitts to play catch the kids working for them in their kitchen started mm-hmm. to use it to play catch themselves and the sergeant called his wife back home and said honey can you send over to bats balls and mitts so these kids can play a real game and one thing led to another and here's this whole wild scene on uh, on national geographic and so everything crystallized to me at that point in time and i thought this is just great this uh, sergeant his name is jay smith uh he did this on his own initiative. You know, the idea that anyone would bring baseball to Afghanistan would be absurd in a way. And it, he was fired up when he was talking about it. And I thought, okay, there have to be other uh, men and women serving around the world, serving our country around the world, who want to do something to help the local population and build relationships and better express who we are as Americans. And they just need some help to do it because they can't do it through government channels you know, quickly enough or what have you. And uh, I was sure that there would be other people back home like me that would be happy to help if only they knew what was needed and that I could use the internet to connect the two, essentially to build a platform that connects supply with demand. It was the, was the central idea. And so after that, I tracked down uh, Sergeant Smith, who's the pr- producer of the show. Um, we were in touch through email. I, you know, wanted to see him in person to talk about mm-hmm. this idea because anything else uh, wouldn't give me a true read on whether it was a good idea. So he said, uh, okay, meet me at Fort Bragg on uh, June 1st. And I said, great, where's Fort Bragg? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, I found out it was in North Carolina and I went there, we met and I laid out the idea, just what I said, which is, you know, you or people like you need something to help the local population. Uh, wherever you're serving, instead of uh, asking your families, you ask me and my organization, and I'll use the internet to get people to help. And uh, Jay kept saying, this is going to save lives. And the third time he said it, I, the first, so this was the first active duty member of the military I'd ever met. And I had no idea that, you know, special forces guys are not, you know, welcoming and eager to meet outsiders and all that sort of thing. And yeah. I just thought, well, yeah. he has enthusiasm's natural. So uh, he explained that because of the relationship that he had built, well, he and his team built with the villagers by doing things that helped build trust and goodwill with them, that the villagers formed the night watch patrol to protect our guys from Al Qaeda with them crossing the Pakistan border at night. And so he, he actually explained how this was going to save lives. And at that point, I thought, oh, man, now I really have to do this. I mean, I can't hear that. And jo- I would never forgive myself if I didn't right. give it a shot uh, understanding that. So that's when... I started the organization. So I, I do have chicken skin as we sit, stay in Hawaii, say in Hawaii. Um, and I wish we had hours to talk about this. You and I have talked about it before, but you you are representing the best of America um, through the spirit. The, that's the name uh, of, of being altruistic wherever we are. And it's not because we're a better country. We were blessed with these incredible circumstances of geography and and everything that led to founding a life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness foundation to our our country, uh, but also business because America does good business, but the government does not do good business. And you're bringing that responsive, customer focused. Um, approach mixed with the altruism of military and diplomatic service overseas, it's it's a it's a secret sauce in my mind. It really is. Yeah, well, and you need both. It's not. Yeah. And, and so what we bring is a critical and what has been missing piece of the ecosystem to bear, which is private entrepreneurial capability mm-hmm. that is fast and flexible. Um, has certain kinds of know-how. It's not about the money. It's about all kinds of things and, and how you think about doing things, more bottom-up approaches. But what we do would be impossible without the collaboration with our troops and diplomats. So it's it's not that one is better than the other. You just need that kind of ecosystem. And to get that kind of ecosystem required basically an act of Congress and an agreement that only took agreement with the Department of Defense, it only took 15 years to get to get, to get uh, in place. But that's all solid now. Yeah. And, and you had the perseverance to do it. I'm going to take my brief break now so we can um, get to the, the rest of the story. 
that talk specifically about Ukraine. On May 2nd, I'll have another great guest, I'm blessed with great friends, uh, to talk about imagining history you can feel. Uh, Clint Churchill is one of the founders of the Pearl Harbor Avi Aviation Museum here on Fort Island. It's an incredible place. Clint's an incredible guy. He's also uh, uh, got a unique initiative going on here in Hawaii that I'll tell you about. But let's get back to Jim and Spirit of America. So um, you did this. You got it started. Yay, yay, you. You can go back to business and, and leave ThinkTech running. But you only did that for a bit, and you came back, and it's become your life, right? Yes, I, I did. And, and why did uh, you come so, back? Because well, you did go back to business for it. For a I, I, I did, and I should note that the first two officers I met after starting the organization were then Colonel Joe Dunford, who was yeah. the chief of staff to Major General Jim Mattis at the First Marine Division in Camp Pendleton. Yeah, we we of have course. a picture view with General Mattis, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you do, and. Uh, so that they would, well, and the shot, uh, the other shot is uh, at the Marines Evening Parade here right. in Washington, D.C. So uh, we did a lot with the Marines in Iraq and then you know, later in Afghanistan. And so in, in 2009, uh, then uh, you know, Colonel Dunford uh, was uh, Lieutenant General Joe Dunford, uh, three-star Marine officer, and he invited me to be the guest of honor at the Marines Evening Parade down here you know, in, in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., which I had never heard of, uh, but it was, uh, well, and the funny thing is when when he called me up uh, to invite me, he said, I'd like to invite you to be the guest of honor at the Marines Evening Parade. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And I was, I said, well, thank you, Joe. I'll, I'll work on my wave, you know, like, like this. <laughs> and, uh, and Jim is not that, unfortunately he didn't hang up the phone. He said, Jim, it's not that kind of a parade. Anyway, so uh, it was, you know, it's with the uh, Marine Corps band, the silent drill team, yeah. the the just an incredible honor and a, a deeply, deeply moving experience. And I thought that if what Spirit America had done up to that point in time meant that much to uh, General Dunford and the Marines, that they would, you know, give me and give the organization that honor, that I owed it to them to do everything I could, especially to help the Marines in their deployments to Afghanistan, because I knew their, our, our decentralized mm -hmm. model of assistance would be a really good match for Afghanistan. So I came so, back to the organization, and uh, here we yeah. are. Yeah, so folks, go to their website, take a look at the work they do more broadly than Ukraine, uh, and who's endorsed it, their board of advisors, myself notwithstanding, is an incredible list of leaders who believe in this unique, one-of-a-kind model that's worthy of your support, and I'll provide that. Uh, link so you can consider donating uh, later. You're, we have to get to Ukraine in the remaining seven minutes. So you're just back. I know that Spirit of America is providing all non-lethal assistance, no bullets, bombs, missiles. So like your helmets, body armor, um, food, first aid kits, right? That's in, lar in large numbers to the people of Ukraine. Yes, I mean, so for Americans who want to save lives and help Ukraine win, Spirit of America is, is truly the, the best option. And what we're doing is taking Ukraine's side. And this is very consistent yeah. with what U.S. troops and diplomats are all uh, geared to do, which is how do we help UK Ukraine prevail in this genuine battle of good versus evil. So mm -hmm. most humanitarian assistance organizations that you, you know, we, we've all heard of will are neutral, which means they will not support right. uh, uh, any side in a conflict. Well, we're taking the side of Ukraine in this conflict. And I understand, we understand that it's not only about Ukraine and the terrible human suffering that's taking place there at the hands of Russia, but it's about the, the really the fight to defend the free world that's happening and the front lines right now are in Ukraine. And uh, it is a good versus evil. And I've been in a good versus evil fight. Might be imperfect against imperfect as well, but the world order will suffer if the Russians are allowed to be victorious in any source. So win is almost a dirty word. Do you get much pushback from donors when you say we're not neutral? We're a not neutral charity slash non-government organization? Or is that something people find attractive? Well, in this particular case, I think it's pretty attractive because mm -hmm. it's so clear. And 
you know, I think people are uncomfortable a little bit with the idea of winning. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's a little hard to explain. Yeah. And it's, you know, the world is a complicated place. War is, you know, messy, terrible, complicated as well. And the idea that you would try to affect something to win is just outside of mo most people's frame of reference. But when you talk to people about it, they go, well, of course we want to help Ukraine win. There's so much at stake. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and for us, you, I look at the situation and say, well, we, we can help the victims of war all day long, but shouldn't we try to stop the suffering at its source? You know, right. that's what we need to do. And that's what we're doing with the non-lethal assistance to Ukrainian armed forces and the civilian volunteers, you know, people like, uh, well, you, you served, Fig, so mm -hmm. uh, you're not a great example of what I'm saying, but you know, the people who, uh, just from any walk of life, who are taking up arms to defend their country and defend the innocents that are being uh, attacked and killed by the, the Russians every day. And if there's any beauty in this ugliness of war, it's been, I think, and you've been there, I haven't, the response of the common citizens of Ukraine who have picked up arms and are defending their own lives, livelihood, their homeland, and their freedom. Uh, yeah, it, it's inspirational. And so yeah. uh, what I think we see is, are some of the benefits of a free society, you know, as right. in America, where right. like, nobody told nobody told me to start Spirit of America. I just did it. <laughs> and nobody told these Ukrainian uh, civilians who are volunteering to go you know, fight as part of what's called the Territorial Defense Forces. Nobody told them they had to do that. And people were, you know, you have grandmothers who are throwing Molotov cocktails at Russian tanks, not because somebody told her to do it or assigned her the job. It's it, it is an expression of a free society, society, which is one of the reasons why it's so important for Americans to, to help the Ukrainians in this fight. And um, it's a lesson to others who may be oppressed, attacked, invaded. Yes. I can think of a few countries and locations that face that. You're actually providing, Spirit of America is actually providing some training um, to those who decide to uh, man up, woman up, whatever, join the militia. Uh, but that's based on a long-standing relationship. How long has Spirit of America been engaged in Ukraine? Because you can't do this instantly. You need relationships. No, and, and it's true. And a lot, a lot of people look at the situation, kind of try to rush in, and yeah. it's much more complicated than it, it seems. You know, you think, okay, well, to send some body armor and helmets or first aid kits over to Ukraine to a soldier, easy day. And <laughs> It's not, but uh, we have been active in Ukraine since 2014, since the, I'll say the most recent original uh, Russian invasion. And, you know, there have been, I think before this war started, somewhere close to 20,000 Ukrainians who have been killed at Russian hands in, in, yeah. in that country. And uh, one of the first projects that we did was help to stand up Ukraine's first armed forces radio station to meet mm -hmm. the information needs of the Ukrainian soldiers on the front lines between 2015 and, and well, uh, up in, well, up until mm -hmm. now, uh, the, right. the station is still still broadcasting. And it's an answer to you know, the massive uh, Russian propaganda and misinformation, which is polluting that, uh, that region. And it seems that uh, the Ukraine is winning the information war, which is shocking. Shocking. Um, so you've got relationships. Uh, we I, we only have a tenth of the time. I'd love to talk. Maybe you'll come back, get an update as things progress uh, in Ukraine. But I know because I've assisted my, minorly in minor ways with some of your efforts in Asia. But you're in Africa. You're in the Middle East. You've been in Syria, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, um, the African continent, Laos, Mongolia, Vietnam. Uh, Pacific Islands, I think. Uh, does that work go on, even though you clearly Jim Hakes focused on Ukraine as the boss? Does does that work continue? I yeah, they, our operations uh, all around the world are continuing, and you know we are supporting the efforts of U.S. military and State Department personnel in, in all the places that you you mentioned. And you know, a good way to think about it is for anyone serving this country abroad. Spirit of America is the best friend they could possibly have yeah. because our only agenda is to help them succeed in what they're trying to do and to advance both uh, you know, our interests in, in national security objectives, but also bring people to choose our side and to choose a side of freedom, democracy, you know, what we stand for as a country. 
and uh, you represent the very best, I think, Jim, of what we stand for. And, and you know, it's, it's hard not to get choked up to see it in such an important time uh, when the country seems so divided. Uh, you, you unite the efforts of uh, civilians, of uh, government diplomats, and the military. We talked a little bit about this because united we win. Divided, united, we united don't we win. win. And the bad folks win. And there's a lot of symbolism we talked about in in what America is and what America needs to be. We're not perfect. No country is, but we bring a lot of hope to the world, and you expand the impact of that hope through Spirit of America. And I'm proud to be associated with the organization and to know you, uh, folks. I'm going to ask you to donate to Think Tech Y too because they make this possible. But before I do, let me give you our, our YouTube playlists for both the old Figments on Reality and this show. Uh, so scan those bad boys and please click like because it makes me feel good. Remember that this is truly a not-for-profit endeavor. Go to Spirit of America's uh, website and take a look and donate if you can. If you just want to feel good, go there. If, if, not, if you got a headache, go there. You'll feel better. Um, Jim, thanks so much uh, for, for all you do, for being a friend. And for your leadership, how many folks are there on the Spirit of America team? We have 27 now. We've, uh, we've 27 grown a lot of doing, <laughs> doing uh, a lot of work and getting the kind of donation support you should, but you need more and they need it, uh, friends, to save lives and to support freedom. So uh, let's stay in touch, Jim. I'm sure we will. We always do. And uh, I hope to have you back on. Uh, maybe in a few months when we know more about the outcome in the Ukraine. Well, Fig, thank you for having me. It's been a, both a pleasure and an honor to be with you. And uh, thanks, everyone, for watching and, and listening in today. All right. God bless, Jim. Thanks, folks. Thank you for joining us for Figments, The Power of Imagination. I'll be back, as you know, in a couple of weeks to have Clint Churchill and talk about history. Uh, Think Tech Hawaii is a great nonprofit, also needs your support to bring you citizen journalists like me sharing their ideas on a <laughs> really wide array of topics that otherwise wouldn't make the air. So thanks for watching and aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.